We are the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by The harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Every difficulty faced in our lives Makes us realize that it's just part of Allah's plan Feeling stronger we take it in our stride Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to episode number 9 of this exciting journey that we have started some time ago. I'm Dr. Abu Yasser, Steph Karis. Some of you might know my book, Europe's Forgotten Ottoman Heritage. Some of you might even know me as the editor-in-chief from the ilmonlinemag.com. I'm a lecturer throughout Europe's universities as well as education institutes. And I have had the chance to travel throughout the Muslim community and find out some incredible, incredible facts about the Muslims living around the world and also finding out our legacy, our Islamic legacy throughout this world. Many people, alhamdulillah, nowadays, quite some Muslims know that Islam is obviously not bound within, within a certain nation or within a certain, uh, within certain boundaries. No, Islam is something that belongs to, throughout the world to everybody in the, on this planet. And everybody knows that wherever you go, you will find some Muslims. Wherever you go, in any city on this planet, you will find a mosque. And you will find people praying. And you will find somewhere, a place where you will find somebody who can direct you where to go to. Alhamdulillah, indeed, it's an amazing, amazing situation if you look at the world nowadays. The spread of Islam throughout the planet. We have seen until now in the last episodes, that Islam spread from the very beginning. Islam spread from its very, very, very beginning in the seventh century already, during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, and not only in the Arabian Peninsula, but we also saw that it was pretty much at home also in Asia, in countries such as India, China, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Tunisia, Malaysia, Indonesia, etc., etc. Now, we know basically that indeed it's not something that was just there to be there in the Arabian Peninsula. No, it was something that had to go throughout the world, it had to go to every person's house. And alhamdulillah, indeed, it did. Now, let's go a little bit back to Africa again. We started talking some time ago in one of the episodes about North Africa. We started talking about the Muslims in Egypt in Tunisia, in Algeria, in Morocco. We saw that the Byzantine Empire was fought back of Africa and that the Muslims basically opened these countries for Islam and North Africa became a Muslim region. Not only Africa's Muslim region, but one of the most important Muslim regions in this planet. From North Africa, we also saw that the first one to put foot in Europe was an African Berber, Tarek bin Ziyad. Now, he was the one who went over to Spain, to Europe. He was the one who basically brought with him thousands of Muslims, mashallah, who in the end conquered or opened, open is a better word, the Iberian Peninsula to Islam, Al-Andalus, as they called it. Now, North Africa, and Africa. North Africa is just a region which nowadays is a very Islamic region. Okay? Egypt, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, we all know. But what about the rest of Africa? What about East Africa? What about West Africa? What about Central Africa? What about the southern part of Africa? How did Islam get there? And was it brought by sword again? Were people fighting? Was a lot of bloodshed that happened that time? Or did it go again like it went to Asia through trade? Did it go there because of merchants, Muslim merchants who went there? Now, first of all, we should not forget one important point that we mentioned earlier. We should not forget the first Hijra in Islam. The first Hijra, which happened already during the time of Rasulullah before the Hijra to Medina. It happened when the Muslims had to leave basically their homeland and go and find refuge in Abyssinia. 
In Abyssinia, there was a judge ruler. The ruler of Abyssinia, called Nandajashi, he was basically a Christian ruler, and he not only accepted the Muslims into his country and welcomed them, but he himself accepted Islam, mashallah. And this is a fact which many Ethiopians nowadays, many Africans, just don't overlook, don't try to overlook. They don't like talking about it. They mention an Najashi because he was a just, ruler, a just ruler, but they don't necessarily would like to go into his conversion into Islam. Because we should not forget that Ethiopia nowadays is the model of the Christian African country and actually was a Christian African country before. Nowadays, you know, we are talking about 70%, 60 to 70% Muslims in that country. So it is not a majority Christian country, but it's a majority Muslim country ruled by a Christian ruler, Greek Orthodox or Orthodox people basically now, Ethiopians. So if we're looking into these facts, we look at the Najashi, we look at the Muslims who had to flee to go to Abyssinia, that time Abyssinia, which nowadays roughly covers the area of uh, Somalia, North Somalia, Ethiopia. Now, if we're looking at these areas, we see that the Muslims there, until nowadays, have been playing an important role. Somalia is basically a Muslim country. Eritrea is a Muslim country. Ethiopia has a very, very big Muslim, most probably majority, although there are differences of opinion there again, if they're now 50-50, if they're 60-40, and so on and so on. But there's a very big population of Muslims living in Ethiopia. If we are looking at these first Muslim migrants during the time of Muhammad Sallallahu during the time of our Prophet, if we're looking into these, the situation of these migrants, they were poor and they had to leave their country, their homeland, because they couldn't practice their Islam properly. They made hijra, basically, for a small period of time. But the influence in this small period of time, the ruler and the people living in that part of the world, in, in, the, in the Horn of Africa, basically, they influence these people living there in such a way that nowadays, as we just said, we have Muslim-majority populations living there. Mashallah. This is amazing. Another amazing factor is again was something that we discussed earlier, that Africa, in that case, became the first country or the first continent, let's put it that way, Africa is the continent, of course, and in that area, specific area, this area became the first area outside of Arabia where Islam was practiced properly, where Islam was allowed to be practiced, although they were still struggling in Arabia. They were still struggling in the Arabian Peninsula. It became the first safe haven for Muslims and the first place Islam would be practiced outside of the Arabian Peninsula. Amazing, mashallah. Amazing. Basically, what we are seeing is that the Arabs were still struggling, or the, the Arabs in, on the Arabian Peninsula were still struggling to implement Islam, whereas it was already implemented in Africa. As well as we saw during that time even, Islam was spreading towards Asia. Seven years, seven years after the death of our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, the Muslims advanced towards Africa and within two generations only, Islam had expanded across North Africa and all of the central Maghreb. Now, we're talking about a, a quite a big area. We're talking about the whole of North Africa going down to the Western Sahara, as we said nowadays, Morocco, Western Sahara, the central Maghreb. If we're looking into this area, this is a massive area, massively inhabited by Berbers. This is, again, something we discussed before when we came to North Africa. The, Berbers, the Berber population that was living there, they were not Arabs. They mixed with Arabs. The Arabs came, of course, there. They mixed, but the majority population living in North Africa were and still are Berbers. They accepted quite quickly, quite soon, actually, Islam. Whereas nowadays, there is a movement among certain Berber organizations and Berber people, especially in Algeria, who are trying to 
um, become a more independent part of the world in a way of um, not, they feel that they were Arabized in that way that suddenly they feel, nowadays they say, that uh, the Arabic language was, was put upon them, that uh, they had, were forced basically to speak Arabic and their culture became more an Arabized culture. Which of course, the influence of the French colonialists who came later, the French until nowadays, have Algeria strongly in their grip and they all were the, were the ones who and are the ones who support a strong independence movement among the Berbers in Algeria. They, that is a, of course the formula of divide and conquer as we know, just divide the people so like this you can control them better. And that's what's happening in North Africa nowadays, especially between the Berbers and the Arabs. There's a kind of nationalistic, even racist movement going on there. This was not the case in that time, of course not, because a Berber was considered Muslim as any other Muslim. So basically, basically, it did not matter if it was now an Arab or a Berber or if it was a Spaniard or whoever it was who did whatever they did and they ruled the country and, and they were basically Muslims. They were ruling an Islamic state and an Islamic government. So, we have to see that as the Berbers were won to Islam very quickly, so were other people as well. And not only in North Africa, but also in West Africa. Now, if you look at the trade relationship between the North and the West, we can clearly see there was a lot of trade and a lot of uh, business going on between North Africa and West Africa. And there was no fighting involved at all. And Islam spread to West Africa especially because of, again, what? Trade. Because of trade, mashallah. Again, again. This is something that we have seen, we have been seeing in the, in the last episodes, that Islam spread through trade, because of trade, to Asia. The same in Africa and the same especially from North to West, West Africa. East Africa, the Swahili coast as East Africa in general, the coast of Africa is called, we're talking about countries like Kenya, talking about countries like Tanzania, countries where Swahili is spoken. Swahili, by the way, very important fact again, Swahili has so many Arabic languages, Arabic words in there, that it's part of, it's considered an Arabic dialect. So that Swahili, can be learned by an Arab within no time, and Swahili speakers can learn Arabic very quickly. That's how close Swahili is to Arabic. It, is developed, it was developed during the time that the Arab traders were trading in East Africa, and nowadays it's part of uh, being a national language in certain countries in East Africa, like in Kenya, in Tanzania, and even in Uganda. The Swahili coast, became known, at least in the Western media, for being the main slave coast, that the Arabs, or the Muslim Arabs actually, as they say, that they were the ones who were basically taking the slaves, African slaves from there, taking them to the Arabian Peninsula. Now, that's something we should be looking deeper into, inshallah, and we're gonna do that after this break, inshallah, and I hope to see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa we are the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by The harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Harder we try In gratitude we pray to Allah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi and welcome back after the break Now, we have come to talk today about an important place actually, as well as an important part of our Islamic history. We spoke about the first hijrah, the first hijrah that Muslims had to make from the homeland down to Abasha, to Abyssinia. And because of that, they influenced, although they didn't stay very long there, they influenced the ruler and his subjects in such a way that nowadays the Horn of Africa is basically an Islamic part of the world, no doubt about it. We have countries like Somalia, countries like Eritrea, countries like Ethiopia, where Muslims play an important role. 
East Africa in general, actually, had already contact to merchants and tradespeople long before Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam played, came up and the message was spread. And there was already commercial and intellectual contact between the inhabitants of the Somali coast and the Arabian Peninsula. This is important to know because when the Western media bombard us nowadays and say, listen you guys, you also had slaves, African slaves and African slave trade. Not only us, not only the Europeans. We were not the only ones who took African slaves and took them to, to America and did what we did to them. No, the Arabs, they also had before. That might be true, that there was a slave trade going on in East Africa, from East Africa to the Arabian Peninsula, but the Arabs of that time, before Islam, there is a totally different phase of, 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 of the slave trade than it was after. Now, we're talking about the Arabs before Islam, and we're talking about the Arabs after Islam. When Islam was there, the Arabs who were Muslims, the Arab Muslims, we have to look at that, and we have to look at their understanding of slavery. We have to look also at the way that they were looking into dealing with other people and what slavery means in Islam. Now, slavery in Islam is part of Islam. There is no doubt about it. We're not rejecting it. We say slavery is part of Islam until nowadays. Slavery exists, but what does slavery mean? Does it have to do with the color of your skin? Does it have to do where you come from? Does it have to do with class or whatever? No, not in Islam. Not in Islam. No, it, doesn't, it, it was not part of, it's not part of Islam, and it was not part of Islam at the time that enslaved Africans, because they were Africans, to take them to the Arabian Peninsula and enslave them because of the color of their skin. No, it was not that. Because if we're looking into the Muslim empires, and if we're looking into the Turkic tribes who came to the Balkan, for example, most of their slaves in the Balkan Peninsula were tall, big, blonde, blue-eyed guys. They were Balkan people. And if you look at Balkan people nowadays, if you look at Bosnians, Albanians, um, Kosovarians, if you look at these people, you see that they are blonde, tall, they couldn't be blonder and taller anymore, right? So if you look at the color of the skin, they are white. And they were also enslaved. It was not a matter of slave being black or white, no. Not in Islamic terms, all right? So we have to look into the Arabs before. The Arabs were doing a slave trade before they became Muslim, and it might have been harsh and bad, okay? No doubt about it. But the Arabs who accepted Islam later, that was a totally different issue. There was a totally different issue because we had, during the Muslim time, also black Muslim rulers. The Muslims who went to Spain, do you know what the Spaniards called them? Until nowadays, they call them moros. Moros comes from the black term mavros, which basically means black. They considered these people coming from Africa black or darker than them. And they were the ruling elite. They were the ruling class. The Muslims who ruled Spain were not white and were not even Arab white. Okay, so we have to look into this one. And that didn't play a role. It didn't play a role at all. It didn't play a role at all in Islamic terms. If you're black, white, yellow, green, it didn't play a role at all. What played a role was your iman, taqwa. This is what Allah is talking about when you're talking about people being basically dealing in Islamic terms, mashallah. Now, as we have seen, Islam was introduced into Africa well before the faith even took root in its place of origin in the Arabian Peninsula. So, if we're looking at the, the way that Islam was introduced into Africa, into East Africa, now we're talking about the Swahili coast. We're talking about areas like the, the Horn of Africa, down to Kenya, Tanzania, the uh, island of, um, uh, in Tanzania, Zanzibar. So if you're looking into Zanzibar, for example, which was known for its slave trade and its trade with spices and all this, we know that Omanis, were the main traders nowadays Oman is so from the southern peninsula from the southern area of the peninsula they used to trade with India and with East Africa and they didn't just use they didn't just trade with slaves but they also traded with other goods okay so we have to look into this one too nowadays 
we have quite some descendants of Africans living in Oman and in Yemen, and they have all equal rights. On the east coast of Africa, where Arab mariners had for many years journeyed to trade mainly in slaves, Arabs founded permanent colonies on the offshore islands, especially on the island of Zanzibar. That's the one I was talking about. The island of Zanzibar is known. In the 9th and the 10th century, which was the golden time of Zanzibar, let's call it golden time, the time where Zanzibar played a such important role, where the trade was actually uh, flourishing in that part of the world. From there, Arab trade routes into the interior of Africa helped the slow acceptance of Islam. So from Zanzibar, going on to the mainland, of course, of Tanzania and Kenya, going into Africa, from there on, Islam was accepted by quite many African tribes. By the 10th century, the Kilwa Sultanate was founded by Ali ibn al-Hassan Shirazi. He was the son of a ruler of Shiraz, Persia. Shiraz is in Persia, Persia, and an Abyssinian slave girl. Listen to that. A very important fact again. The Persian ruler was married to an Abyssinian slave girl. Okay? And basically, the son of this ruler played such an important role in history. And that's how it was in Islam as well. The Turkic tribe, we should not forget this one, Turkic tribes before the Abbasids, or during the Abbasids actually, they were nothing else but slaves. And if we look at certain dynasties, and not only in Egypt, but in Africa in general, we will find that most of them, the Mamluks, were nothing else but slaves. Mamluk means slave. So, look at Islam in that, such a way. You can be born a slave, and you can become a king. You can become a ruler. And this is just possible in Islam. The 13th century Muslim traveler Ibn Battuta, I'm sure that most of us know him, noted that the great mosque of Kilwa Kiswani was made of coral stone. Now, a place in Africa which has a, a, a big mosque, the great mosque basically, is made of coral stone. And it's the only one of its kind in the world. And he noted it already during his time of travel in the 13th century. Also, the same person was the one who noted that whenever it was Juma, Friday prayer, he would, you would have to go early to the masjid because you wouldn't find place to, to, to sit. That's how full the mosques were at that time in Africa, and that's the way that Islam was practiced. Martial arts, an amazing situation. In the 20th century, nowadays, Islam grew in Africa, both by birth and by conversion. Still, until nowadays, from the 20th, now we're talking about the 21st century, until now, we have conversions in Africa on a daily basis, mashallah, on a daily basis. There is actually, we're talking about a kind of religious fight in Africa going on between Christianity and Islam. It's impossible, I have looked into many sources and I have a lot of different uh, types of data here. Some of them indicate, when they talk about Africa, they talk about Africa having a majority population of Muslims, and others say the Muslims are second after the Christians. Others, again, say that the Christians are in such a way, they're growing in such a way that actually we will have in some years most probably more Christians in Africa than we have Muslims. Others say the opposite. So it is very difficult to determine exactly what is happening in Africa. It's very, very difficult to say. But there is a religious uh, fight between Muslims and Christians going on. And not only in the sub-Saharan Africa, but also in North Africa as well. We should not forget, we have countries like Egypt, where we have 10 to 12% Christians. We have countries like even in Morocco, you will find Christians as well as Jews. So there is always the element is playing a role in this part, in this part of the world. But no doubt about it, there is no doubt about it that Islam came to Africa in such a way that Christianity didn't. The only Christian country in Africa, the way it existed as a Christian country, was Ethiopia. Ethiopia was and still is the only Christian country in Africa in such a way that Christianity plays a big role within the government, okay, and has a political influence in such a way from the beginning until now. But Islam, Islam changed the structure of, 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 of the whole African society. Many African tribes accepted Islam, 
until nowadays, the, Af the Islam that is practiced in Africa, there might, there might be different types of, of organizations that exist in Africa, there might be different type of branches of Islam, but Islam plays a massive role in this continent, much more than it plays in many other continents. We know that Asia is obviously the continent where the majority population of Muslims are actually living on this planet, but we know that in Africa, there is more a fight of a battle of religions, especially Islam and Christianity, more than in Asia. Now, we're going on with this subject, inshallah, in our next episode, and I hope you're enjoying this until now. We have actually finished now the ninth episode, and we're going on to the tenth one, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, I would like to thank you for your patience, and we'd like to see you soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum We are the Muslim Ummah, and each day that goes by, the harder we try, in gratitude we pray to Allah. Chosen as part of the best of mankind We spread the word of Islam Every difficulty faced in our lives Makes us realize that it's just part of Allah's plan Feeling stronger, we take it in our stride We are the Muslim Ummah And each day that goes by the harder we try, in gratitude we pray to Allah. Chosen as part of the best of mankind, we spread the word of Islam. Every difficulty faced in Allah.